evening lecture is at the Mariner Hotel at 67th and Atlantic, recognizing the Christ consciousness, and that's at 8 o'clock. What a privilege it is to introduce our dear Swamiji. He needs no introduction to many of you, but since his life is so interesting, I want to read this again and share it also with those of you who are here for the first time. The Reverend Adano Christopher Lay is a native of British Guiana and came to the United States when he was 15 years old. He was brought up in the Roman Catholic Church and studied for the priesthood before embracing the Eastern philosophies of his Mongolian father. He has done extensive research on the prayer healing techniques of the American and Canadian Indians and also spent time in Mexico with the Mayan and Aztec people. He is an ordained minister of the All Faith Fellowship in Tyler and is married to Margaret Lay, a, practice, a practicing chiropractor and director of a Montessori school for children. They're building a spiritual uh, retreat and community there in Tyler. Reverend Lay was initiated into the ancient yogic order of Saraswati in 1969, and that was after meditating for eight hours a day for 21 years. Saraswati indicates a spiritual path through the intellect, and Nityananda suggests the characteristic of getting down to the fundamental details of truth. Many of us call him Swami Nitty Gritty. I was reading through Yogananda's book, uh, The Master Said, and picked this up. Let this meeting house remind us of our own cathedral within, and let us open our spiritual ears to hear the truth. Swami Nityananda Saraswati. Thank you, Alan. Well, before we start, let us just calibrate our minds. Meditation techniques for awakening consciousness. The first thing we must have a definition. And this word is very difficult for most people to understand. They say, How do I meditate? How do I awaken my consciousness? And how many types of meditation are there? And what is it going to do for me? Is there any shortcut method to realization? My answer is no. There is no shortcut method to realization. But if you understand the mechanics, then you can participate in an awakening and an unfoldment of your own consciousness. The word meditation is an acronym. That means it's a word comprised of many other words utilizing the very first letter of the word. And we are stuck with the unique science in a strange way all through the centuries to awaken consciousness. Let's take the word Meditation. The first letter is M. We're dealing with mind. This is a peculiar 
function of our being. According to Mr. Casey, he said, mind is the builder. Well, we do have mind. That's kind of irritable. We do have mind, our consciousness. And unless we understand what mind and consciousness are, we don't really get an experience. Mind can function as the five senses. Mind can function as memory, logical computing. Mind can function as intuition. We are speaking of the totalness of mind. Hence we are speaking of total consciousness. And the Oriental people believe that creation is total consciousness, but not solely total consciousness. There must be a counterpart or some function to make it manifest. And we look around ourselves and we see that science is in agreement that there is consciousness, there is this creative intelligence, but there is also another part of existence that we are now trying to understand. That part is called energy. So we have M E mind or consciousness E energy. You know energy as the force in all substances. In the East they may call it spirit or in the scriptures they call it spirit. So these two things are actually existing and are responsible in myriads of ways for our creation or our physical existence, conscious energy. Now energy is not moving blindly. It is always moving and acting in a conscious way. You recognize consciousness in terms of symbols, ideas, thoughts, only because you associate these ideas and thoughts. I'll take, for instance, a snowflake. You look at a snowflake under a microscope and you see a geometrical formation. But it's not geometrical to you in your frame of reference until you had something to compare it with. If you did not see angles and movements, lines connecting themselves and having some meaning, they would be absolutely meaningless from mere observation that a snowflake would have geometrical lines. So telling yourself, that's where we get the word intellect, to tell back to yourself on a conscious level what is occurring as it is, is the first level of awareness. You cannot begin the first level of awareness until you tell yourself back. Now, if you hit your leg, you don't know what it means to you until someone tells you that that sensation is pain. They can tell you that sensation is joy. And every time you bump yourself, it's joy. And the next time you do like this, and stretch your lips up, they tell you that's pain. And you will go on doing that whenever they say it's pain. And you see, you will intel, you will tell back to yourself what it means to you in terms from the environment. Experiments have shown that if you take some eggs and put it in an incubator and hatch it, and let no one of the chickens see any human being, but you just put your hand inside the incubator. They haven't seen their mother. 
but they put their hand in the incubator and on their hand wear some gaudy looking stone their first impression of that gaudy stone moving around touching them would make them feel that is mother you take your hands out and put all the chickens on the floor and you know they begin to follow you wherever that gaudy stone goes you can put the stone on a mechanical gadget and let it move they will totally ignore you to follow the stone they are telling themselves back internally that is their first contact so consciousness is doing this to us via a retinal photography of the brain until we can understand this we don't see why the third letter in the word meditation is important we have mental or mind or consciousness we have energy the force field now D direction or distribution energy is not stagnant it's moving it's constantly distributing itself constantly manifesting and behaving according to some pattern or rhythm so our universe as it appears to us is the result of this distribution process going on <clears throat> not too long ago some scientists have come to the conclusion that this is a universe based on a triune principle the scriptures a long time ago said this whole universe is a trinity in a unity a three-in-one God but that was for religion it was not for science until we saw the birth of the geodesic dome we did not begin to think in terms of a triune force field not a three-dimensional universe but a triune force field that everything centers on consciousness which is ideal then the necessary output energy then the sustaining force of that energy how it is being utilized if you buy a house that's the idea you have in your mind it's a desire how you take care of it inside that's the output energy and if you go in and out of it daily that's how you are utilizing it you don't live in your house all the time and you don't live outside of the house all of the time and your mind relates to your home when you're away from it and your mind <laughs> relates away from it when you're inside the home you're busy thinking of the restaurant away from your home while you're in the home and you're thinking of your home while you're in the restaurant at the same time see how your mind flipping back you never stay in the area where the body is most of the time now <coughs> here we're in this room this room we came here with a certain desire motivation we are partaking yet the mind was restless prior to entering the room for the brief moment you sat down the mind is still relating to outside the mind is not relating here it is not distributing the energy necessary to stay here as the mind becomes aware of where it is in terms of the physical body then we have now a distribution process going on inside until we accept this we will not be able to shift into levels of consciousness naturally it is natural <laughs> to shift into levels of consciousness we do this all the time and don't recognize it all right. We have mind or consciousness.
consciousness, we have energy, we have direction or flow. So the energy is moving according to the pattern that is set up. Now, the next letter is I. And this is the first thing we hear when we philosophically approach meditation. Don't bother about your eye, your little eye. And this is the first eye. It's true, from the philosophical level, we are not too concerned with our individual eye. Yet, in another school of thought, it tells you, you must worry about your eye. It's all there is. It is you. You must devote more time to this I because there's nothing else except yourself as you are. Then these two schools of thought are in conflict to push the I away or to emphasize the I. And let us see what the yogis tell us. They say both are necessary if we understand the next letter in the word meditation. Otherwise, it would not be necessary. You can eliminate one and keep the other. You can eliminate the eye and live without it, or you can eliminate the idea of not having an eye and live with the idea of having an eye. But it's the next letter in the word that makes all the difference. T, thinking. This is the only important true function of the mechanism. To think. As a man think in his heart, that is what he is. It is thinking that makes it important. You go to sleep, thinking is shut down in certain levels. And if you do dream, you are still thinking. But if you're not conscious that you're dreaming, that doesn't say you're not thinking. Thinking is still going on. It's going on in, in levels that you are not totally aware of, but it's going on just the same. When you wake up, the mind thinks. It has to relate. It has to distribute energy. It has to consciously move itself and exert willpower. But at the same time, this thinking that is going on in you is dualistic. That's where we get the next letter now, A, activity. We have an outward action and we have an inward action. We will see now why the thinking <coughs> and its activity determines the little I being important, not important, or is the collective function of the I. The activity that's going on in the brain are millions and millions. Just to give you an example of how this activity is an asset or a detriment to the eye. You go to work tomorrow and the boss tells you, John, you've been so long with us. We are very, very pleased with your work. We're going to give you a raise. Automatically, your eye your whole mental world pattern starts expanding. Everything becomes cheerful, rosy, and possible. Let's reverse the process. You go to work tomorrow, and they tell you, John, you've been so long with us, and we're totally disgusted with your work. We'll have to let you go. Now your whole eye starts to crumble. You see only one escape of this suicide. See what happens? The eye now is suddenly made to fall apart. Before it was made to grow, now it seems to collapse. We realize that we are a victim of this interplay of the thinking. And we are not in full control of the I. 
if we're in full control, we would go on towards harmonizing with the environment, synchronizing with it, and make a new change, a new alteration in consciousness. All right. We have M, which is mind or mental, E, which is energy going through you, D, which is direction or distributing, I, which is the individual ego, T is the thought or the thinking functions of the mind, A, the activities, the interplay. They're dualistic. Well, let's see now this activity principle. Here we get caught up in the mental block of a free will and a divine will. We can think, we can act, therefore we're free agents, we can choose, and nobody has the right to tell us what to do, and therefore, who is God? Who needs him? The thinking has reached the point where there is no need to rely on a divinity because the thinking has suddenly out-analyzed itself and we are now the victims of over-self-analysis in the interplay of thought activity. We come to what is called a dead end in the thought play. There is no more hope and like one great actor said, life is boring, therefore I blow my brains out. He has reached the end of the interplay. But to the spiritual man, that is the first prerequisite to be a disciple. When you reach the end of the thought play, the game play inside, and come to what we call total frustration, this is the readiness of a disciple. When I asked my teacher one time, Paramsi Yogananda in a letter, what constitutes readiness in a disciple? In the East they say, when a student is ready, a master will appear. Well, I had the wrong illusion or notion that readiness meant I should do everything possible, clean up, get ready, and he is there, and then he touched me and he said, ha boy, you did a wonderful job, now you don't have to worry. <laughs> then he wrote me back a simple letter with one word. This way, this way, this way. The one word, frustration. Then I knew I was ready because a master is only one who has overcome frustration. He has no more frustrations. He has mastered the interplay of the I, the thought activity inside. Therefore, they do not lead him to frustration levels of behavior. Once mastering it or getting out the maze of the frustration levels of feeling, one begins to enter now new levels of feeling in consciousness. Meditation is to open up for us new levels of feeling and behavior in order to transform the physical form. So we come to the next letter in the word meditation M-E-D-I-T-A-T. -E that is now the time cycle towards something. That is the most aggravating period, the time cycle in meditation. You may start out today and after 40 years of assiduous meditation, you say to yourself, you're a failure. And after 100 years more, you're still a failure. After 100 lifetimes, you still say you're a failure. When with this culmination point ever occur. The time cycle. Not enough time to meditate. Everybody is bugging me, I want to meditate. I want to grow up and meditate. So, you know peculiar behavior? You recognize some peculiar friends? Time. He's the guy that's whipping you along. In the Eastern teaching, they call him Kal. You might as well call him Satan too. It is that particular function that hangs heavy on the mind. We want instant this, instant that, instant this. But when it comes to meditation and altering consciousness, it doesn't work that way. It's the first time you learn that time must work for you and not you to work for time. 
It's the reverse. Years ago, I used to always be late, and people would be aggravated. And every time I was late, I'd hang heavy in my thought. I'll be late, I'll be late. So one day I says, why am I beating my brains out? Can they ever be late too? <coughs> it's not possible for them. Are they that 100% mechanical, accurate, perfect machine, punching the clock without failure? Even a computer breaks down. And a human being is the most delicate computer. He can be off. He says, from now on, they are late. Whenever I arrive, it's early enough for everybody. <coughs> Strange thing. I've seen too many evidence of this phenomenon of late and being early. It all comes together. You may say coincidence, but they are no coincidence. It is the thought and the action. Realizing the mechanics, realizing the environment or the sphere of behavior you're working with for the first time, we can now have some tangible experiences in meditation. The next letter is I. M E D I T A T I. You notice this word has only two eyes. Well, the first eye is very individual, egotistical, or self centered and does not have much to do with a higher principle of behavior. But it's the first one you come in confront with. The second eye is the real eye. Now, you go into yogic studies or metaphysical studies, they always tell you, try to find the real eye. Try to understand the eye of Jesus. I and my father are one. I, 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 I. The real eye how does that real eye work in us? If we want to recognize it, then it must have some behavior. If we don't recognize it, it has no behavior for us. It's just another word. And in fact, if you were to paint yourself into the corner of your mind with all the verbs and adjectives in the various languages of the world, there's only one word will get you out. Think of it. Only one word in all the languages of the world will get you out of the corner of your mind. Remember, frustration is being painted into a corner. You were painting this room, and that's the door. And if you paint it up to here, and there is no door here, you won't get out. You'll be standing there looking at the wet paint. Thought activities or thinking relationships are like that in the brain. We want to get out to a new insight or a new level of awareness, but we have placed a whole display of verbs, adjectives in front of us, never truly getting out. The only way we can get out is like the Zen Buddhist who said to the boy when he was reaching out for him, the boy was hanging on a limb and he looked down and he saw the bottom of the mountain and all that he's holding on is with a little limb sticking out of the edge of the cliff. He said, if you let go, you'll be nothing but a mess of bones and all you need to liberate yourself is to say I. Well, think of it. I. Every time you say I, there is an influx of energy. The moment he was told to say I, he broke the illusion of his helplessness. And how much he could relate and alter his consciousness via the hands to the limb. The limb would absorb his consciousness and retain enough strength to hold the boy till the other man would give enough time to reach and pull the boy up. It was a matter of time play. But if he panicked, his eye would start to diminish in his hands, and then the rock would start to loosen up, the branch would come down, and he would go on down to the ground. Would not be enough time for the other man to draw him up. 
but because he was told by the teacher, say I, I would start a reinforcement in you. It will start a sudden flow of force in your field of existence or awareness, and you will go beyond the sensory nature. This real I is called the intuitive eye in you, the eye that knows independent of the senses. For the first time, you can sense something beyond the normal range. Intuition is that ability to know independent of the senses. In meditation, this is what we are trying to release. We are trying to release the intuitive nature in order for it to observe where we are. And after we observe, then we can become one with it or identified with it. So in Eastern teachings, they tell us meditation is a twofold nature. That is, exists with seed and no seed. Well, a seed is an object. No seed is no object. What they're trying to say is this, that when you are meditating on yourself, you can either be objectively looking or you can be objectively absorbing or becoming one. So there is the difference between sensing as an observer or sensing as part of the thing. So intuition is what we're trying to awaken in meditation. So intuition of what? The next letter is O. This O is dualistic. Observation of ourselves as we are and oneness of ourselves as we really are. It's to be one for the first time. One with the vital life impulse. Now, we can see this condition in terms of consciousness and beingness. When you observe something of yourself, you are conscious. When you are being yourself, there is no consciousness. And this happens when you have mastered something. When you start out to drive a car, you're very conscious of how many people are around you, the shifting of the gears and everything. Very, very conscious. Very, very oversensitive. As soon as that consciousness dips down into what you call confidence, or you become competent, when consciousness now shifts into the levels of beingness, you are now, for the first time, letting go of the ultra-sensitivity of yourself and flowing. Therefore, it comes second nature as another term. You tell yourself, in telling yourself, you see, you're telling back to yourself what has happened to you. You are actually relating back to yourself. Hey, wait a minute. For a moment, I was pretty nervous. Now I'm not nervous. But the fine line between extra nervousness and no nervousness or calmness, how did it happen? Who changed it? Who suddenly made this sudden shift and erased all this sudden fear out of our minds? How did it suddenly move over from a sensory nature of being conscious to all of a sudden a nature of, I know, so what am I worrying about? I can drive. And the first thing you shout to the, ah, I can drive, I know, I can do this, I can do that. Why? Because it has precipitated into the beingness of you from a conscious level. Your consciousness has suddenly shifted into the beingness of you. You are now flowing for the first time. This takes time, I admit. Otherwise, we'd all be living in that state. It's like the chicken in the egg. We are all conscious of the fact that eggs are responsible for chickens. At the same time, we argue that chickens are responsible for eggs. All right, where is the egg? Where is the chicken? <coughs> Nobody wants to admit that the mother hen's heat is responsible for the whole thing. She has to sit down on that egg, otherwise no chicken is going to come out. And then the chicken, she knows exactly how long to sit on the egg for 21 days, and then all of a sudden the, the egg breaks open. Out pops out the chicken. We are seeing consciousness and beingness 
we are seeing a shift between observation and the oneness. For the first time, we are seeing this movement inside. This is an intuitive pull within ourselves. The last letter in the word meditation is N. Noumena, not phenomena. It's a big difference between noumena and phenomena. Phenomena we are aware of by our constant observation of creation around us. There are always waves of phenomena, changing and changing all the time. But coming into noumena, <coughs> it is the actual transition of this mechanism, the reality of who you are. So we can sum up meditation as a descriptive way to ourselves as mental energy directing individual thinking or thought <coughs> activities towards an intuitive observation and oneness with noumena. Having this understanding for the first time, it frees us from a whole host of mental doubts about ourselves. Then we can start the process of technique and use. But until that time, technique is absolutely futile. Use, again, is limited. Because if you don't handle the, the mechanics, we can't work it. If we don't know how to sh turn the, the ignition switch in a car, and understand how the gears shift inside, we would be absolutely frustrated in trying to drive a car. The first time you go to learn, you have to learn its ABCs, its mechanics. And the driver who is teaching you has to tell you that this is forward, this is first, this is second, this is third, this is reverse. And how you press in the clutch and release, that's now you have automatic transmission, but even that, again, is total flow. Meditation is the same. If we understand what is happening around us, what this shell of life or environmental existence is comprised of, then it becomes possible to flow into it. Before we got into this shell, we were traveling along a certain thought pattern in terms of prayer. If ever there is a frustration level, we resort to prayer. And when the prayer don't work, we get a little bolder and we resort to analysis. We start analyzing, we start picking ourselves apart. <coughs> Do you recognize it? As soon as you've got some frustration level, the first thing you want to pray. And when you find that don't work, now you say, the heck with the prayer. Let me get down to some tangible activity. Nature's pushing you to analyze it. Why am I this? Why am I that? What does it cause? Then after a while, you, you get some relief, but then it comes back again. It's not uh, releasing itself totally. It's not discharging itself into your system. The frustration is not going away. The hostility is not going. Then you come to the next level that is meditation. All right, we understand the mechanics now. We need technique. Prayer is a soul's SOS. <laughs> you know what an SOS is? It's a distress signal transmitting that you're drowning but you need help. <coughs> You're drowning in the ocean of words. All of us are drowning in the ocean of words which make up behavior patterns for us. Kill, walk, talk, steal. These are words, but they have behavioral patterns, behavioral movements. We are drowning in them. <coughs> we need help. Who are we telegraphing to? We're telegraphing to intuition. The guy who don't make no mistakes and knows the exact word to pluck out like a life belt and pull you out of this ocean of words so you don't drown them. So he said, if I only had the right word or the right idea, I wouldn't be in this predicament right now. I know exactly what to go and do. We're telling ourselves that all the time. Well, who do we want to give it to us? The psychic has his open up. 
when we don't open ours, so we have to rely on the psychic, or we have to rely on some other person who has his intuitive nature opened up. Why not open your own? This is what the whole thing is. What we see now, prayer is only the soul's way to telegraph or transmit outwardly for help to the intuitive nature. So we can sum up prayer simply as the privilege of the soul to communicate with its creator on a SOS basis. That is on a projective basis. Very few of us communicate with the creative source on a receptive basis. A receptive basis of communication is adult prayer. Juvenile prayer is transmission. Adult prayer is reception. You know it now as meditation. Meditation is trying to receive, not trying to transmit. You're not transmitting in meditation. You're trying to receive. So technique must be based upon the mechanics involved. Jesus taught people how to pray. He told them when they want to pray, go into the innermost chamber, which is a toilet or middle room in the house or some other area. But that's projecting out. Bringing it back in is what is important. How do you bring this energy back in? If you taught the technique, you can bring it back in. You can go around in circles thinking you're meditating. And most of us think we are meditating. No one is going to tell them they're not. You know, good many people take meditation. And all they're doing is like sticking a, a key into an ignition switch of a car and turning it on. Never shifting the gears, but the car is running. And they're going. We're going someplace. You ever see that? They're going someplace, yes. It's all going someplace. But the car is never going anywhere. Sooner or later the gas runs out and then meditation becomes a very futile thing. It runs out because it does not satisfy what truly is involved. It does not get into the, the true regions of the consciousness. The car may go through all types of vibrations and feel in itself that it's going someplace. We do have this. We have a, a whole host of imaginary travels when we turn on the ignition switch of a car and go to a place. Even to the extent we go to those little uh, Coney Island place, and you know, they turn it on and let you bump around. But somebody there is have a big major switch when he knows to shut it off and all the equipment stop. This is as far as we get with it. When we go in to meditation, we are trying to receive for the first time. Therefore, technique is a necessary process. Now, if the teachers of truth did not give us technique, then we would be wasting our time. They did give us techniques, very simple techniques. It's so simple that we don't even recognize them. The very first technique they gave us was to look inside. And we can quote Master Jesus. He said, when the eyes are single, the whole body is full of light. I was speaking earlier about energy. We're talking of energy as light now. Jesus is talking of the same energy as light. Atomic physics. He's not talking of uh, random words. This whole universe is a play, a retinal photography on the brain relating to atomic physics. And it's the first time you see creation as it is in light. As you look inside, you are a miniature universe in a bigger universe. You are this light inside, right in here, when the eyes are centered. Now as you look, the light takes different shapes and different colors. But Jesus went on to elaborate on the technique. He says, the light is shining in the darkness. That means the light is already glowing in you. You don't turn it on. You have nothing to do with turning it on. All you have to do is recognize it and observe it as it occurs in your brain. This is why when you go to a movie house, you don't tell the uh, people who sell you the ticket what type of program they should run on their screen. The program is advertised outside. You pay your money, you sit down, and you let them play the program for you to look. Equally true. God has advertised his program. 
It's called cosmic awareness. Seeing creation as it is for the first time inside your mechanism. Cosmic light and the myriad shapes and atomic movements, mathematically moving, color wise, sound, and everything, all going to play inside of you. This is the first time you're going to experience it. You're going to go in and experience it. Now, if you don't have the experience, you don't know what it is. You can be assuming a lot of it. It's when you go inside and start to see it for the first time coming in. This light is shining inside, but it's shining in the darkness of the brain. Now, many people say, how is that possible? Well, you hit them on a the nose bridge and they see light. Who put the light there? Now, that light seems very insignificant to them that this can be God. They never give it a chance to reveal itself. And that's where the workload comes in. It's the next part of the technique. Let your light so shine before men that they may see the good works and glorify the Father which is in thee. You've got to work at it. You've got to actually bring this light to the surface. You've got to make this thing work inside. You've got to constantly merge with this light in order for this light to open up. And as soon as it opens up, it will flow out through you. Now, if you're in doubt as to that, that is where usage comes in now. How are we going to use this light? Where are we going to use it? How are we going to recognize that we are got out of it? The person who is constantly crying about their frustrations is making progress. So don't knock your frustrations, they're necessary. As long as you recognize them, you're making progress. You need that frustration, you need that agony to give you more drive more push, more devotion to overcome. This is what they call the good works now, you're churning. Meditation is reception. Now if you're going to uh, say a four and a half hour movie, there's an intermission period if there is. If there is none, you have to sit through the four hours and you may squirm all the way through. And you may be aggravated all the way through. You may go into some of the feelings of the movie. You may even say, boo, watch out, he's going to kill you. <laughs> you may even get so engrossed with the act. Watch out, there's a car coming. I've seen it. That people get into the act. Equally true inside, this gradual need for identification begins to occur. As we look inside, more and more, we can become one with the movement. Becoming one with the movement is the whole essence of the movie, is the whole essence of this existence, becoming one with it. Because you are participating for the first time. You are not merely an observer, but you are participating. Meditation is to help us to participate on a receptive level of the inward movements of our makeup. Now, here is an interesting experience for some of us. Who is in this room has never had a disappointment? Can you raise your hand? All right, everyone has had disappointments, right? Can you remember the first one? when they wanted to buy you something from Santa Claus and then they couldn't afford it and then they said, no, you didn't buy it. And then you get all angry. All right. We're going to use meditation now. How are we going to use meditation to alter consciousness? Most people want to meditate so that they can be God-realized. That is true. We become God-realized through meditation, but using meditation on a, a level where it is going to help us now to work out some of the deep-rooted, deep-seated shocks, feelings that aren't coming out. And you look at your neighbor and say, I forgive you, but on a biological level you can't forget them. Every time you see them, it's agony. So this is what we're talking about. Meditation now being a media 
of receptivity to clean out some of the ingrained patterns in the mechanism, trying to use it now on a tangible basis. Think of your disappointment. So if you're thinking of it, you have to close the eyes and recall it. If you recall it, you can observe it. Wait until you can re-identify with it. If you can re-identify with that disappointment, a strange phenomenon will occur now. You will shift over from observation into oneness and the pain will come back. As soon as the pain comes back, as soon as that pain returns to you, then you will find if you can flush it out of your system. If you can actually use meditation now to flush this out from your system, if you can draw from your survival makeup, which is the God in you, or the intuitive level makeup in you, and bring this agony out on a conscious level and really release it, you have done the first real meditation that is of value to yourself. Health, which is vitality, health, which is awareness, a shifting of consciousness, has begun for the first time. You have shifted a level of consciousness from the one point of isolation to another point of flow. You are no longer mentally or biologically relating to an agony that is there if for the first time you are releasing it. It's flowing out from yourself. Take one disappointment. We ask ourselves, what should we meditate on? Many people ask that. Some people, I should meditate on God, I should do this. All right, what is God for all of us? God is bliss. The highest experience possible that man can have in his physical mechanism as a human being. Bliss is joy. We don't pray to God for more suffering, yet we have suffered a great deal by our overexposure to the environment. We are given a process of how to unlock the joy in us, how to release the joy in us, how to transcend these shocks, these particular pain relationships from our inner mechanism. And if you take one disappointment, just think of one, no matter how insignificant, and let it flow out of your system. You have altered, you have actually shifted your consciousness on an actual level inside to produce now joy. It's the uses of meditation that must become simple now. If we don't simplify their uses, then it's up in never never land. We can say transcendental meditation, we are avoiding all our pains and going off into some region. True and fine. Pin it down to what is actually <coughs> occurring inside and objectively look at it. Then you won't need the words, the flowery words to hide behind. You will see now for the first time, you are consciously shifting out of your mechanism levels of agony, frustration into levels of joy relaxation. And when this occurs, you've got realization, something real, concrete occurring within you as a result of a shift of the feedback within your mechanism for the first time. There is no pain flow. You've taken a, a, a condition that has given you pain and agony, you look at it for the first time, observe it, and then you have resolved it by the receptivity of the consciousness to look at it. God is there. He's not a person telling you what to do. He is that vital life power locked up in you, waiting to be released from the very disappointment, the very grief, to a surface level in terms of joy. Now, most people know that when they go to church and do confession. You know, in the ancient days, they say, you must come and confess. Somebody has done you something and there's agony inside. And if you talk it out, you release it. Meditation is to bring this to the surface. Something that is done in there 
and bring it to the surface and release it. When it's released, it's over. Anyone who is meditating will tell you, after a long time, they're becoming more and more peaceful, more and more conscious, stronger and stronger within. The evidence of a valid meditative growth is the strength to face the interplay of the thoughts in your consciousness daily. This is the evidence of a real meditative growth, the inner strength to face the thought play that is occurring in your consciousness every moment. Then you know, without doubt, without anybody interceding or dominating your consciousness, you have unraveled the actual force, the actual power, spirit, the divine impulse, and bring it to the surface to give you that conscious release. In other words, you will be fulfilling this parable of the prodigal son. You are looking at the object or the problem halfway within yourself by facing it, and God, the vital power, life itself, is meeting you halfway by releasing you from it. If you got any ache or pain in you, or any doubt or anxiety of somebody who you haven't forgiven, <coughs> then put meditation to the test on a practical, tangible basis. Not just merely saying, oh, I forgive them, and I pray, dear Lord, forgive them, forgive me. It don't work that way. We have to go inside and look at the thing and see it, and then try and release it. When we can identify again, the flow out is possible. The agony will go out, and the tension will go out, because <coughs> this is the actual uses of good meditation. We want to meditate on God, the creative intelligence coming into us. But we must also realize that when we meditate, we are on the receiving end. The receiving end is bliss. But before we can have bliss, we're going to have more pain. Many people who have gone through genuine meditation break down in tears. Some people say, how can that be? I sit down, I'm supposed to be very peaceful after my meditation. Yes, you do have peace. If you just sit down and don't have any interaction, this is a form of immunization. Nothing is really occurring inside yet. When you really get in and take some problem and try to relive that problem and then try to release that problem and feel the end result of that problem being true bliss, you are never bothered it. And in fact, whoever that person is, they are getting a healing too. And you are getting a healing. Meditation brings in a healing as an actual force field when we identify with any problem and live it out again. We can do this in terms like Shakespeare. Shakespeare said this, the world is but a stage and we are merely actors. We have our entrances and exits. Good. Somebody done you something? Put yourself in their shoes for a brief moment in your mind and see how it feels. How it feels for them to do you something and how it would feel for you to do them back something. You know, we're so wonderful people. I wouldn't strike my neighbor because Jesus said, turn your left cheek and the right cheek. But you know, we're a bunch of hypocrites. You want to strike so badly, so desperately, you kid yourself into death. When in reality, this inner mechanism has to release itself some way. We don't have the right to go kill anyone. Or we don't have to physically go hit them on their head. But we can psychologically recycle this attitude by an inward meditation according to the rules of Madison Square Garden and Jesus Christ is the referee. Put the other guy in your shoes and you get a good pair of hands and give him a good whacking and always remember Jesus says, don't kill him. And get it out of your system. It's all right. You're released. 
because this empathy, this feeling, this remorse has a chance to go out. But you don't have a physically to go and hit him in the head. You can see this in your consciousness for the first time. That which you have suppressed, you reverse the role and look at it now for the first time objectively. And then feel what it feels like. The feeling that you were subjected to. You know them because you, you retain them. Now, turn it around and see that other person going through the squirming. It's only a, an image play, but in the image play, it's release. It's freedom. Meditation now brings peace because it will dissolve itself. The peace will flow for the first time and you may break down with a hearty cry. Big as you are, as small as you are, you release. released. And when we cry, we are happy because it gets it off the chest. Thank you. Someone had a question they wanted to ask. I said before, you are like in Madison Square Garden, and the referee is Jesus. You have to have someone who must know the rules all the way, from start to end, and uh, you have a confrontation, you see the person with, with you in front of you, you're reversing the rules, you know how it felt to be hurt by them, so you are giving back that as a release. It's like boxing. And you're boxing according to the rules, you know. The umpire comes in there, or the referee com comes in and says, Now, gentlemen, you, this is according to the rules, and you spar and get off, and, now, and you go off into your corner. And it's resolved on the decision of forgiveness. It's an inward forgiveness that must come from a, a level of respect. We say to ourselves, we forgive people. Verbally, true, we do. Biologically, we don't. Deep down in our survival mechanism, we would like to talk about the guy in the head. But because we are not allowed by society to do that anymore, we don't do it, so we suppress it. In ancient days, you'd walk with your war club and wait till you find him in a dark alley and do clobber the fellow. So, but then, you don't have a refereeing or a sort of a point of reference for equalization. So the agony stays on and you get more and more frustrated and life becomes very, very difficult in terms of making decisions. The decisions are totally thrown into all streams of internal conflict to a point where you can't decide no more. All right. If you have Christ and his approach to the problem, then you can resolve it. Remember, he said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. By slugging it out inside, then when you are totally released of the agony, you're going to feel this sudden rush of a warmth. And then, relating to Christ as the forgiving principle, first you're forgiving the other man, and you're forgiving yourself, and both of you are forgiving each other in a way tears will start to flow and you are releasing yourself. This is what we call recognizing the Christ consciousness in you. 
That's the night's lecture. That's one of the ways you recognize it. This inward release that comes from a intimate participation in a meditation. Not just a mere meditation where you observe something and do not become part of the process. When something has intimately occurred in you, to alter some level of feeling or conscious awareness in terms of release, you have tapped the true inner Christ in yourself. Yes? It awakens the intuition because for the first time you're going to be aware of that person feeling it in release. And you're going to have a sort of a, a feeling of knowing independent of the senses. And if you do meet that person, they will be the first one to start making some reaction to you without you trying even to impress them. That means it has transcended your five senses to communicate back to them a release. You may say miracle if they suddenly turn around and start a conversation with you on a more friendly basis. You would not recognize it, but uh, those who have had the experience can tell you a month may not go by before you suddenly find that person is coming knocking at your door looking you up. And you may not know why he's looking you up or want to talk to you or her, but they seem to be drawn, or both of you seem to be drawn for the first time in close proximity. For years, you may not even have anything to do with that person. You can't say it's coincidence now. You're entitled to say that if you want, that these two people suddenly meet in such a short space of time after this internal release, and then on a verbal level, have a friendly communication. And the old hurts are suddenly diminished. And they may be the first one to make excuses for uh, ever having hurt you. Is that what you call intuition? It's the highest form of intuition. It knows independent of the senses. They don't know it. You recognize it. You know it. And you for the first time, it pulls. It's knowing from within yourself, independent of the senses, that they have been released. If you know from inside that you hurt me, and you have this release go out, wherever I am, I will feel it. This is a peculiar awareness. And well, what is ESP and what is intuition? Extra sensory perception is the word called ESP. How many senses do you have? All right. Intuition is knowing independent of the senses. How many senses do you have? All right. So if you have five senses and for the first time you know independent of them, they're extra function. The word extra don't mean you have an added function. It means for the first time that these functions have been speeded up. In other words, the term acceleration is the correct interpretation of these forces. My five senses are limited to here, right? Now, if I wanted to go into an accelerated state, I would know what's going on outside without having to go outside. You may use the term extrasensory, but there is no extra sense. It's an accelerated function of those senses. Take a microscope. A microscope is only a magnification of something you don't see with the ordinary range of the eyes. And then you say someone who doesn't have a microscope to work with can suddenly see the microbes. How does he see it? By magic? Or because the, the magnification of, and the acceleration of sight has suddenly allowed him to see what you would not normally see and would need a microscope to see. Or a telescope is the same thing. Telescoping, microscoping are extensions of your five senses. X-ray and radar and all these are extensions of the five senses. To the range of where you, the normal sense does not communicate back, but when accelerated 
for the first time can pick up. So intuition is an acceleration. It's a knowing independent of the senses. I'll give you another illustration of what I'm talking about. Have you ever seen a Venetian blind? All right. When the blind is down, you have the slots, right? If you turn one slot, what would pa happen to pass through if there's sunlight outside? A little light will pass through one slot, right? All right. You turn a second slot, you have a little more light coming into the room, right? And gradually, every slot you turn, you have more light coming in. Through your five senses, you are allowing light to pass through into your mechanism. And by turning these slots, you can have light. Now, if you pull the blind in such a way that all the slots are open, for the first time, you will have a great flood of light in the room. But there is always a shade or a shadow because the slots are like that. They're blocking. So whatever light that passes through, it will look like it's slightly diffused. It's not 100% pure light. There's always that shade. So sometimes people with extrasensory abilities don't have the true picture. But nevertheless, they do have a understanding of what is passing through. Now, take the cord and pull the whole blind right up to the top of the ceiling and let all the light flood right through. Now we have, for the first time, intuition, knowing now, totally independent of the senses. Because you have to yank this consciousness out and shut up all the, the sluts of the, that uh, Venetian blind and pull it all the way up and let the whole light flood in. Now Jesus is teaching us this by the very fact he tells us in meditation. And he's saying it, what it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. We can have these psychic of abilities like the finger, like your uh, slots. The light will pass through here, but it's blocked wherever a slot is. Only that much is passing. It's when you move away the finger, you have the whole force field. So we say, shut down the senses for the first time and let the light pass through. As you shut down the senses, the light will pass through. Meditation is to help you to shut down the senses that it will perceive. And you are seeing it from inside of yourself now for the first time, independent of the senses. Yes. But for the first time, you're becoming a human being. Because if you keep the suppressed thoughts in you, those thoughts will eat away at you. And you are no longer <coughs> going to act like a human being. Right? Now, didn't Jesus say you must forgive your fellow man? And if you're going to forgive, you have to release it all to be whole, complete, human. It's essential to let it out. Very, very important to let it out before it can release you. Spirituality is held at its highest when it's released. There are no hostilities in there now. It can take more than a lifetime later. Sometimes many of us can't break through it. You know? Many of us may not be able to break through some of those things. No, you have to close the lids. It's like going to a movie house. They shut down the light in the movie house in order to project on the screen. Well, if you shut down the eyelids, 
but don't fall asleep. This is what we're trying to get across to our minds. Do not fall asleep. You just shut down and watch. Now, while you're watching inside, the light will start to manifest inside. And as you watch the light now, you don't tell the light anything. So, what you're really doing inside is like this. From TV station J-O-Y, program L-O-V-E is coming in to S-O-U-L in the form of L-I-G-H-T S-O-U-N-D. There are three positions that the eyes can be in. Down, up, or forward. Now, technically speaking, when you observe the individual, when he's hypnotized, the eyeballs have a tendency to turn up. He's in a different range of awareness. Now, when he's looking out in the outer realm, his eyes are wide, expanded out. Now, when you're asleep and you're not dreaming, the eyes have a tendency to turn down. When you're dreaming, it starts pulling back up. Now, if you're in a trance, the eyes will pull themselves up. If you're not in a trance and you're just merely closing your eyes and cat napping, the eyeballs will go down. So if you say the yogis have their eyes up, it's only a physiological pull. Now this is a strain on the brain for most people because they're not accustomed to being in that state. We're trying to import or impart to you, don't force the eyes up too quick. And if you look at paintings of saints, you ever look at their eyes? What position are their eyes in? Why? Because when you start out looking forward, and you close the eyelids, sooner or later the light seems to be just above the nose bridge and it seems to taper up and you want to look slightly at a 45 degree angle. The light is always here at this point. It's not dead center here, it's just about this point. So if you see the image of Buddha with a little knob on his forehead, you may think it's a mole, but it's the representation of the third eye and it's just it's a slight elevation point <coughs> that you're looking at. But don't force it. When you close the eyes, nature itself will pull the, the eyes up slightly to let you look at it. And that's what you're looking at. It'll pull it itself and don't have to force it. Yes, to some extent, but that is different. You're meditating and you want to have an experience of a conscious identification with some thought pattern to release it. And if you're meditating strictly on the light inside, the light will break up into many colors. And the colors are important in the meditation. There is a gold ring, there's blue and white. There are many other colors, but these three colors are important in the meditation. Because you are, if you strike a match, you'll see these three colors. This is the light you're looking at inside. Now, how you feel inside, if you have any anguish or pain, you may want this to suddenly go up into the light and flush it out. You can do that. But you want to see this light and go with it because that light will start drawing you inward. Now you'll also hear a sound because man this sound and you'll hear the sound, the sound will start pulling him up. 
The moment you hear the sound inside, you will start ascending. In the beginning was the Word, which is sound, and the Word was with God. It's in consciousness already. And the Word is God. Makes all the difference now. The Word, the sound, the audible life current is God. See, He doesn't have a form. The highest form He can take is yourself. But then you can't accept that because no one wants to accept he's God. But then you can be very egotistical and shout, I am God too. But that's the final culmination of the form of God, like man. Now the word is God, the audible life current is God. And the word was made flesh. Audible life current became us and dwelt in man. So we have a direct link to God all the time via an internal retinal photography. So as we look inside, we reverse this process and we can hear the sun going on inside. Yes? Enjoy it. <laughs> Enjoy it. There are sounds that you will want to hear eventually. First is the sound of the bees. Then there's sound, it sounds like grasshopper chirping. And then you may hear the sound of the flute, Krishna flute blowing. Or you may hear a trumpet, all the reed instruments will play. Then you may hear the sound of the harps. And then you may hear the sound of the bells, a whole carillion playing inside. Then you may hear the sound of the ocean, a conch shell blowing the roar of the ocean. You may hear thunder inside. And finally, you will hear like a drum too, but then finally you'll hear like bagpipes are blowing. They're all inside of you. Then the whole thing becomes a symphony. God is the music of the spheres, or the atoms in motion. But this is the cosmic sound that you're listening for or hearing. It changes you. Because you will recognize some changes in yourself when you hear it. There are lots of things that happen in your body when you hear it. Long, not too long ago, I met a young man who had just come back from India. He was standing under a veranda of an ashram, and the swami was passing on this veranda. And he and his wife was downstairs under the veranda, and two other people. And the swami was just walking across the veranda above. And he said to his wife, don't you hear the, the flute blowing? She said, what flute? Knocked the other fellow. He said, don't you hear the flute blowing? He said, I don't hear anything. Knocked that fourth person. None of them heard the flute, yet he heard the flute. So he's puzzled. The Swami walked across the balcony and went down to the end of the balcony, and he would hear this flute going on. Later in the evening when they were introduced to the Swami and they sat down to eat, he said to the Swami, can you explain to me why I heard a flute blowing today? And the Swami looked at him. He said, uh, it's obvious, young man, that you're <laughs> hearing God. Were you in the days of Elijah or one of the old Isaiah in the old prophets, you might be saying, lo, I turned to the east and heard the voice of God like a trumpet blowing. And it was like the voice of many waters, like the ocean flowing. You were fortunate to hear the audible life current flowing in your body. The, the Swami just emphasized it to make the man realize he was hearing God. So he asked the Swami, then God has a form if music is all around. And the Swami said, yes, look at yourself in the mirror. He said, that's the form, you. Eventually, as you meditate, this inner consciousness will open up. You have to meditate. Yes? This release can come... Oh, 
Well, yes, I just gave you one example. And don't uh, think that the uh, release don't come by other methods. I just gave you an example of uh, releasing a, a problem with you and someone else. You know, the Hindus have a saying, and the Indians on the reservation have a saying. You don't know the load of another person's back until you put it on. And the Indians on the reservation says, you don't know another man's agony until you walk in his moccasins. So you don't know what it is when someone hurts you until you try to live and feel what hurts them. You see? Now, it's a feeling principle. Meditation is a feeling principle. You're trying to relate back into feeling, to use feeling as a means of releasing. Now, the greater love or the greater bliss that comes from meditation is not just sitting down and closing the eyes, you know, and nothing happening to you. This is one form of bliss. Yes, it's true. It's there. You can sit down and close your eyes and feel this bliss. There is nothing else but that. That's just one level of the consciousness. Now the next level in where you want deeper bliss, bliss that is truly engrossing to the extent that you know now that the, what oneness is with God, is when you take part in a particular life experience and reverse this process inside and feel it. Yes, but you wouldn't know it. Let me ask you. Well, let me show you how you will always remember it. Have you ever had a dream where you hurt yourself and then you wake up, that particular spot of where you hurt yourself pains you? You know, if you see yourself in a dream and you stomp your toe, or you kick something, or you hit yourself, and when you wake up right in that spot, there's a sensation in the waking state. If you had such a dream, then you have already shifted consciousness. Now it's to go back into that same experience and look at it objectively for the first time and release it. If you can have a dream <coughs> in where you are running and fall down and stump your toe, then all of a sudden wake up out of the dream and know it's a dream and still feel your toe hurting you, you had quite an experience. Yes. Could it not very well be when you have this with activity and you twist it with another person that they're releasing? And you just feel it better. All right, good. <laughs> That's true too. Yes. They can have it. See, it's not necessarily you alone. They can have that release too. They do have it at times. Yes. Well, then when does meditation become contemplation? Contemplation is before meditation, man. Most of us have got it, the cart before the horse, by saying meditation comes before contemplation. Meditation is direct oneness with God. Contemplation is hoping to become one with God. You're contemplating the possibilities. <coughs> You're not involving yourself with it finally. See, to contemplate on the thing is not actually living it. You want to be one with it. You want to have the force field moving inside. The mystic contemplates before what he wants to contemplate on, before he goes into the meditation. Let's say, for instance, I'm contemplating what happened to me in 1959, in the month of December? I go and contemplate this whole process, but I'm not involved with it as an actual experience as yet. I have to go back now and try and bring all the, the movements inside to live it. And the moment I live it for the first time, live through that whole process, then I have brought back an actual meditative release. You know, we can contemplate all our lives and never get a release. And yet when you're faced with an actual meditation that opens you to release it, that's the first time you have something tangible. 
because remember the, the, the description of meditation is very simple. Mental energy <coughs> directing individual thought activities towards an intuitive observation and oneness with the noumena. That is the actual thing that happened there inside of you and you actually having a oneness for the first time. There was an archbishop who wrote this before he died years ago in England. He said, when you can feel the joys of another in yourself and feel your joys in them and feel their pains in you and your pains in them, you have meditated, my son. He was telling the early uh, novitiates who were growing up to be in the church, the bishops. He was actually telling them the results of his meditation. When you can feel it, he didn't say when you can think of it, it's when you can feel their pains and joys in yourself and relive these experiences, then you have had a meditation. There was also a Catholic saint by the name of Anselmo, who lived many years, there are very few writings about him. And he said the same thing. Meditation is that particular experience in which all things are in you and you are in it. So they're talking of an actual oneness with experience. And it's not on a conscious computing level, it's on a beingness level. There is a difference. Yes? Um, concerning meditation techniques, um, two questions. One, is it helpful to concentrate on a chakra or a nerve energy center? Two, what about breathing exercises? Are they helpful <coughs> previous to going into meditation? Let us observe what you're trying to accomplish, then you will see if it's practical or impractical, or if it's good or not good. What are you trying to accomplish by concentrating on a nerve center? <coughs> yeah, what do you think you're doing? You see, your answer is in your question. If you only look at the question you ask, the answer is there. If you are concentrating on a particular nerve center, what are you trying to accomplish by concentrating there? Well, Remember, meditation is to bring you into a state of oneness. Now, if you're concentrating on a nerve center, are you trying to accomplish oneness there? Or are you just tra uh, practicing concentration as a means to steady the mind? Yes. 